can y'all still hear me? Yes. Okay, good. I just saw my internet. It's like my yes. internet, my internet was messing up. Um, sir, I do have a question when you get a chance about the um, pre-lab quiz on one of the models. All right, so let's get started on this. So we're going to go over the blood today with the blood information and start looking at uh, just a couple of the models, but mainly uh, from this packet, because the models are easy to identify. <clears throat> we're going to go over ABO blood typing, what agglutination tests are. Um, and then we're going to finish up with something called hemoly hemolytic disease of a newborn, which is also called erythroblastosis fetalis. So let's go through the introductory material first. All right. So blood is a liquid connective tissue. I wish I could turn that off. A liquid connective tissue. You learned about it in AMP1. It's made up of really two main things. There's a liquid portion called plasma, as you know, and a cellular portion that is composed of what's called the formed elements. And we're going to go through the formed elements. That's all the cells and the platelets in the blood. So the blood has three important functions, although it, you know, has many more than this. This is just some basic functions that I put together. The blood transports everything around your body, something you already know. Nutrients and waste products, the nutrients from the food you eat, waste products from your cells, respiratory gases, oxygen, carbon dioxide, all the hormones you learned about, circulating hormones from the hormone chapter, medicines you may be on, all sorts of things being transported all over the body. And obviously we learned that the heart pumps the blood through the blood vessels. Arteries carry blood away from the heart, the veins carry blood back to the heart. We did all that on the first test, right? Blood is also involved in protecting us. Number one, it can clot itself. So if you cut yourself, blood can clot. You know that. That prevents a loss of blood. Um, there are white blood cells in the blood that protect us against foreign invaders, right? Uh, immune responses, not specific and non-specific resistance to disease, which we're going to learn in the lymphatics chapter. Um, as far as regulation is concerned, the blood can regulate its own pH. There's some things in the blood where it can regulate it, the pH in the body. We're going to learn about acid base and, and pH regulation at the end of this semester. Um, but the blood is also involved in thermoregulation, something you learned about in AMP1. Blood transports heat around the body, right? So, uh, when you're cold, we vasoconstrict vessels in the skin. That prevents blood from going to the surface of our body and thus losing heat. When we're hot, just the opposite happens. We vasodilate the blood vessels in the skin. So more blood volume can get to the surface of the body. And heat can dissipate from the surface of our body and cool the blood off, which would cool your body temperature off. So it's involved in that regulation as well. So those are pretty simple functions. Just make sure you review them, what I have here, and you'll be fine. Now, as far as blood is concerned, we have something called whole blood. Now, whole blood, surprisingly enough, makes up about 8% of your body weight. So 8% of your weight comes from the blood in your body. Kind of a lot to me. Their whole blood is composed of plasma and formed elements. So if you look at this tube that I drew in over here, this would be a, a, a figure that represents the fact that I put blood in a test tube. And if you put blood in a test tube, obviously the whole tube turns red, right? Now, if you take that tube and you put it in a special machine that spins it down, it's called a centrifuge, you can separate the components of blood out. What makes up whole blood? Well, here is a diagram that represents a sample of whole blood 
that has been spun down and we can see separation in layers in here. And we're gonna go over that, right? So whole blood is formed by the, the fluid portion and then all of the formed elements. So as far as the separation of blood is concerned, the majority of whole blood, about 55%, give or take, is made up of plasma. It's main, and that is mainly water. That's where everything's dissolved in there. All your ions, your electrolytes, respiratory, some respiratory gases are in there, nutrients, waste, hormones, all that stuff we just talked about, right? Um, then in a, se a separated sample, you then see what's called a buffy coat. The buffy coat is the area of a, a spun down sample of whole blood where all of the white blood cells and platelets would reside. So when you spin the blood down, the white blood cells and the platelets fall out at the area called the buffy coat. And then the very bottom is the area called the packed cell volume. The packed cell volume is related to what's called the hematocrit. I kind of use these interchangeably. And the hematocrit is a diagnostic measurement of the number of red blood cells per unit of whole blood. All right, so let's look at this spun down sample. On a spun down sample, the part at the top is gonna to be all the liquid portion. So that's all going to be the plasma. You're going to have some antibodies in there, hormones, whatever's dissolved in the blood in here, right? Then you see this little area right here. It's not really this color. I just made it that color to show you a separation, but that's called the buffy coat right there. Um, and that's where all the white blood cells and the platelets would, would lie when you spin it down. The, Largest amount of the pack uh, of the formed elements is what we call the packed cell volume, which is all of the red blood cells. So it's a larger volume of all of the formed elements because the majority of all of the cells that are in the blood are red blood cells, which has hemoglobin in it, which is red. And that's why this is red. All right. Now, about 45% of whole blood are all of the formed elements which would include the white blood cells, the platelets, and the red blood cells all in here. The other 55% or so is the liquid portion we call plasma. Now, <clears throat> ultimately, if we look at the hematocrit, which is basically the number of red cells per unit volume of blood in an individual, there are normal averages for males and normal averages for females. So in this picture up here, what I tried to show you is some differences between what would be normal, what would be low, and what would be a high hematocrit. Now, of course, I just drew these out. It's not directly, I didn't measure everything, but this one is Vial A, tube A, represents a normal hematocrit. And notice in here, for males, the normal hematocrit is uh, anywhere between 40 and 54%. But for females, it's a little bit lower. And the averages are 45% for males, but only 42%, give or take, body size for sure, and what's going on in the body, for females. The main difference between these numbers is due to testosterone in the male, all right? So nonetheless, you don't have to know these ranges right here, but you should know the averages, all right? So you should know that the, the average for males is 45, the average for females is 42. So tube A is representing the average, the normal average. Tube B is showing a low hematocrit. And a low hematocrit means you don't have enough red blood cells per unit volume of blood. In which case, a person would have anemia. So this could be anemia, a low hematocrit. That's one reason why someone would be anemic, right? Uh, and that's what anemia is. 
It's a decreased oxygen carrying capacity of the blood, really caused by a couple of things. It could be caused by the fact that there's not enough red blood cells to carry the oxygen. The other one has to do with how much hemoglobin's in there. I'm not gonna get to that. But nonetheless, this represents a low hematocrit, lower than normal. There are conditions that can induce a higher number of red cells per unit volume of blood. In which case, the hematocrit would be high. And one reason for that would be too many red cells per unit volume of blood, which is called polycythemia. Polycythemia. And you might think, oh, that's good. We have a lot of red blood cells. We can carry more oxygen. Well, only to an extent. Because if you increase the number of cells per unit of bl whole blood, that means you have more cells than you have liquid per unit volume of blood. The blood viscosity gets thicker. The blood gets thicker. The viscosity goes up. And if the viscosity goes up, as you learned in the last, for the last test, that causes the total resistance to go up, which makes the heart work harder to pump a thicker blood through the vessels in the body. So that can be bad. Um, and I typically go through a little lecture describing what's called blood doping with athletes and not doping meaning drugs, but blood doping is where an aerobic athlete, a runner, a bicyclist, or a swimmer would take some blood out of their body they would freeze it, and just before the athletic event, they would thaw the blood out and put it back into their body to artificially increase the number of red blood cells because the number one limiting factor for an aerobic athlete to be the best at their sport is the efficiency with which their blood can deliver oxygen to the muscles. And since the majority of oxygen is delivered around the body in red blood cells. If you have more of them, you could deliver more oxygen. Well, a long, 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 long time ago, decades and decades ago, some uh, Olympic cyclists died from doing that. They put a, a, too much of a hard work out, a, a workload on their heart, and they went into cardiac failure. So you can't do that, all right? So I put a little bit here about anemia. You can read through it. A little bit about polycythemia. And then the hormone that causes red blood cells to be produced, which is called EPO, erythropoietin, all right? So erythropoietin is the hormone that causes red blood cells to be produced. Now, if you don't know, we're about to get into all of the cells and see a little bit about what they do. If you don't know, all of the formed elements, red blood cells, all of the white blood cells and platelets come from red bone marrow. All of your blood cells and platelets are produced in our red bone marrow. And our red bone marrow is found where we have spongy bone in the bones of the body. You learned a little bit about that in AMP1. So red bone marrow is found at the epiphyses of long bones, the ends of long bones. It's found in between the compact bones, the plates of, of flat bones, so in flat bones, and it's found in irregular shaped bones like your vertebrae and your vertebral column. So the red bone marrow is a tissue that gives rise to all of our formed elements. EPO is just one of the hormones that triggers one of the formed elements to be produced and that's red blood cells. There's other hormones and signal molecules that make platelets to be produced and white blood cells to be made. So red blood cells are called erythrocytes. I'm assuming you guys know that already. White blood cells generically are called leukocytes. There are five major classes of leukocytes and we're gonna go over them. The leukocytes can be separated into two major groups. They're either called granulocytic cells or granulocytes or agranulocytic cells or agranulocytes. 
if you say granulocyte, you don't have to repeat the word cell on the end because the suffix C-Y-T-E means cell anyway. So granulocytes are granulocytic cells, if, you, if you're understanding my verbiage. All right, so the granulocytic cells include three leukocytes, neutrophils, basophils, and eosinophils. Those are the three granulocytes. The two A granulocytes are monocytes and lymphocytes. So what I want to do right now is go through a little bit about each one, a little bit about what they look like, how you identify them, and a little bit about what they do. All right, and you can find that information in these little paragraphs that I wrote. So let's start with the granulocytes, specifically with the neutrophils. Neutrophils are the most numerous of the white blood cells, by the way, by number, uh, under normal conditions in your blood, in whole blood. Neutrophils and the other granulocytes, eosinophils and basophils, which are at the top, are considered to be granulocytes because they have these little granules in their cytoplasm. They have these uh, in, uh, particular, very specifically stained granules that can be observed in the cytoplasm of the cell. Now, the neutrophils are one of the easiest blood red, uh, leukocytes to be identified on a real blood smear, by the way, because they're identified uh, by their nucleus shape and by their coloration patterns. All of the cells are. So neutrophils are also called polymorphonuclear cells. Poly means many, morpho is shape, and nuclear just means nucleus. So neutrophils have a three to five lobe nucleus. That means they have these little lobes, three to five of them. Whenever you see these multiple lobes in there, you automatically know you're looking at a neutrophil, okay? Now, the reason why they're called neutrophils is because the granules that they have in their cytoplasm contain certain types of chemicals, which are different from the eosinophils, different from the basophils. The chemicals in their granule, when we stain the cells, when we stain the, a blood smear slide, their granules kind of look clear. They take up an acidic stain and they take up a basic stain. And I don't know if you remember from chemistry, but when you mix an acid and a base, they neutralize themselves out. And since they neutralize themselves out, we call them neutrophils, the stains anyway. But nonetheless, the chemicals in their granules is what's going to afford their particular function. So like I said, the neutrophils have different chemicals than the eosinophils than the basophils do. So right off the bat, if you see a three to five lobe nucleus, you're looking at a neutrophil. Now, as far as what neutrophils do, the neutrophils are involved in helping get rid of bacteria during bacterial infections. It's not the only thing they do, but they're pretty good at getting rid of bacteria. Now they can do that in a couple of ways. They can perform phagocytosis a little bit. That's not their primary role, but they can, they can gobble up some bacteria. But their primary role is to release all of the chemicals that are in all these little granules. And all those granules are, are little secretory vesicles that will fuse with the plasma membrane and dump out what was in the granule. You know that as exocytosis. I'm sure you remember that name. So when granulocytes, like neutrophils, exocytose out their chemicals from their granules, that's called degranulation. They degranulate. And what comes out of the neutrophils granules? Well, just some of their compounds are these. They release strong oxidants. 
Strong oxidants are chemicals that cause oxidation. Oxidation is a chemical reaction where a molecule strips electrons from another molecule. So if a molecule gets electrons stripped away from it, it becomes unstable and the molecule starts to break apart. So if that happens to DNA and RNA and proteins on the inside of a cell, the cell's gonna die. So what are some examples of strong oxidants? Well, you know a couple of them, hydrogen peroxide and bleach. You use them at home. Use them to kill things, clean up wounds with, at least with hydrogen peroxide. Well, neutrophils make these things. And those compounds kill off bacteria and other infectious microbes by oxidizing them. These are strong oxidants. <clears throat> Another one strong oxidant is something called superoxide anion. This is an oxygen molecule that has an, ele an extra electron on it. So it takes a, neg a negative charge. This is a very reactive oxygen free radical. This can even destroy your own cells. In fact, oxygen is deadly. It can kill your cells, kill bacterial cells, but in our cells, we have enzymes to break down these things so they don't destroy your cells and tissues. So neutrophils, three to five lobes, that's how you identify it. It helps get rid of bacterial infections via phagocytosis and releasing strong oxidants. They also release a protein called perforins. You might see that in your book if you're reading along in your, in your lecture book. And perforins poke holes in the, in the uh, cell walls of bacteria, kill them. Now eosinophils. Eosinophils take on kind of an orangey look, an orange reddish stain because the granules in their cytoplasm take up an acidic stain called eosin. That's why we call them eosinophils. So eosinophils release strong oxidants as well. They release toxic proteins and they help dampen out allergic reactions. They help decrease inflammatory responses. So how do they decrease inflammatory responses? Well, they release an enzyme called histaminase. Histaminase is, and this is all in their granules, in their cytoplasm. Histaminase decreases the activity of histamine. I'm sure everybody's heard of histamine before. If you have allergies, you do, right? So if you get an allergic reaction, you go take Benadryl. Remember those commercials, Benadryl, the histamine blocker? So at any rate, histamine is one of several classes of chemical compounds that bring about inflammatory responses in our body. And so that's why if you're trying to decrease, if, if you have, you know, a rash on your skin and it itches, you can go put Benadryl cream on it. Well, another thing you could put on it is some hydrocortisone cream. That's an anti-inflammatory as well. So our eosinophils are somewhat anti-inflammatory because of histaminase. But eosinophils also help eradicate the allergens and the antibodies of the allergens out of the body. And they're effective against killing parasitic worms. So eosinophils can accumulate around a parasitic worm if someone has a uh, say an intestinal worm, or uh, everybody probably heard of the pinworm. Y'all probably heard of that, like kids get it, they go to daycare and stuff like that. Uh, Enterobius vermicularis is the pinworm. So in someone that has, say, a, a parasitic worm infection, if you took a blood, a blood count, took some blood, did a differential blood count on them, their eosinophil count probably would be higher than normal because they got a parasitic worm infection, right? So... You have to be able to identify these things and just know a little bit about what they do. Basophils are the exact opposite to eosinophils with regards to inflammation. So when you see the term basophil, which is a granulocyte, you need to think 
inflammation. So first of all, <clears throat> basophils are the least numerous of the white blood cells under normal conditions. If you did a, a, a differential blood cell count, they, under the microscope, they take up a dark blue, black, or purple stain. Their granules, which are very numerous, get really, really dark, and it really kind of occludes the nucleus. You can't really see the nucleus too well on a microscope slide, but they'll look like a, a small blue, black, or purple cell because their granules stain so dark. So basophils normally bring about inflammatory responses because they release inflammatory compounds like histamine, heparin, leukotrienes, just to name a few, there's two more major classes of them, right? So these are our inflammatory cells and these are our anti-inflammatory cells. That's what you need to think of when you think of those. Now, what about the agranulocytic cells or the agranulocytes? Why do we call them that anyway? Well, we call the lymphocytes and the monocytes agranulocytic because they don't have conspicuous staining granules in their cytoplasm. They do have some, but they, they have far fewer granules than the granulocytes do. That's number one. Number two, the agranulocytic cells, even though they do have some granules in there, you can see on the model some little bit of dots in there, that's granules. Same thing with the monocyte down here, some granules. They, but the function of these cells, these cells do not rely on chemicals in their granules. They don't have to degranulate and dump out chemicals everywhere in order for them to do their job like the granulocytes do, right? Now there's a whole chapter on these cells. So I'm just gonna give you the basis on them for now. We have a whole lab that we do just on these types of cells, which are in a lymphatic system. So the lymphocytes come in two major categories. They're called T lymphocytes, T as in Tom, T lymphocytes or B lymphocytes. There's even subclasses of the T lymphocytes that we're going to get to later. But for now, what you need to know, these are our immune system cells. These cells become activated against particular pathogens that are infecting your body, whether it's a bacterial infection, a fungal infection, or viral infection. Different types of subclasses of these cells become activated very specifically against that particular pathogen. So as it turns out, our T cells, that's short for T lymphocytes, are very good at destroying cells directly. So that can be cells that are infected with, uh, say, a virus. That can be your own cells that become cancerous or that can be a bacterial cell that's infecting a wound site somewhere. B cells, which is short for B lymphocytes, <clears throat> are the cells that produce antibodies when they're activated. So I'm sure you heard of antibodies. We're gonna talk about antibodies today. Antibodies are produced from activated B lymphocytes. So when a B cell becomes activated against a specific antigen or pathogen, it's called a plasma cell. So activated B cells produce antibodies. The name of an activated B cell is called a plasma cell. So those are the cells that make the antibodies during immune responses in our body. Now monocytes, are the largest of the white blood cells. They have a horseshoe shaped nucleus and they're phagocytic. When these cells, like some of the other cells, are activated to go to a particular site in the body where we might have trauma, say we cut ourselves, uh, we have an infection, 
our white blood cells migrate to those spots. And when our white blood cells migrate to a place in the body where we have a pathogen trying to cause infection, they can leave circulating blood. It's kind of strange. Our white blood cells can actually get to the outside of the blood vessel they're tra being transported in. Typically that happens at capillary beds and small veins called venules. But when they leave the blood flow and enter a tissue, that's called immigration. So they immigrate into a tissue to do their job. Not all, it's kind of simplified it, but when monocytes immigrate from circulating blood into a tissue, they turn into macrophages. So I'm sure you heard of that term before, a macrophage. Macrophages are found in tissues, not circulating blood. Monocytes are found in circulating blood. But nonetheless, macrophages develop from monocytes. When any one of the white blood cells leave circulating blood and enter a tissue, they change what they look like, that's their morphology, and they change their physiology. They become activated. Some of them are activated in different types of tissues and elsewhere in the body. We'll get to some of that later. But when monocytes become activated, they're called macrophages. Macrophages are the little nurses in our body that keep everything sterile. They gobble up any bacteria that's trying to cause infection. They get rid of your dead or your own damaged cells at a wound site. They basically undergo a major phagocytosis event. They're highly phagocytic. They just gobble everything up to clean up everything in the body. Those are called macrophages. They come from monocytes. Now, we have a couple of models that you need to be able to identify everything on, and this should be the easiest part of everything. Um, so get through that as quickly as possible, all right? We're gonna have some more detailed information later on with, with models and whatnot, and, and starting next week, in fact. So you wanna get through the blood information as quickly as you can and start on your digestive system module and all the information and the models in there. So let's look at this model real quick. I'll just tell you, everybody already knows all the little red discs, the red blood cells or erythrocytes everywhere. But all, and notice the red blood cells, do, mature red blood cells called erythrocytes do not have a nucleus. But white blood cells do have nuclei. So all of this, the formed elements that have nuclei in here are white blood cells. Platelets, which are these little bitty pieces of stuff on this, pla on this model plaque right here, those are not a whole cell at all. So there's no nucleus in them either. So all of those little bitty uh, structures you see there, those are platelets involved in blood clotting, right? Now you have to be able to identify the white cells, obviously on, on this plaque. So um, if you look here, the one that has the little blue dots in it, that's always a basophil because it's, their granules stay in blue, black, or purple. Um, the cell, that had, that's kind of small with a big nucleus here, here, and here. Those are lymphocytes. You know a lymphocyte because its nucleus is almost a perfectly round circle, right? Um, the cell that has multiple lobes, three to five lobes on its nucleus are always neutrophils. The cells that have, oh, I forgot to tell you that, the cell that has the red orange granules and a bilobe nucleus, two lobes, is always an eosinophil. So those are eosinophils right there. And this one down here is a monocyte with a horseshoe shaped nucleus. This is also a monocyte. Its nucleus is all, almost horse shaped right here, horseshoe shaped right there. So those are monocytes, that's how you identify them. And here are the cells again. You'll see these in, in some of your, your exercises. Erythrocyte, the small cell with a rounded nucleus is a lymphocyte. The horseshoe shaped nucleus is a monocyte. The one with the blue dark granules are basophils. A bilobe nucleus with orange or red granules is eosinophils. And the one that has a multiple lobes nucleus is always neutrophils. 
All right, so not too hard to identify those blood cells, especially from these models, pretty easy. What kind of gets students though is blood typing. So we're about to venture into what is called ABO blood typing system. The ABO blood typing system. There's 30 or so different blood typing systems. They're all based on the presence of certain type of antigens in the membrane of the red blood cell. So depending on what type of antigens are in the plasma membrane of the red blood cell, you would have one particular blood type or another one. Now, the reason why you always have to learn the ABO blood typing system is because if you give somebody the wrong A, B, A, B, or O blood, you can kill them because it causes a major reaction in the body. And that's what we want to avoid. You don't want to give somebody the wrong type of blood. So we have to figure out, number one, how do we type the blood? What is a blood type? And how do we determine who can receive which blood types? That is part of the goal for today's lecture. So let's see. The ABO blood typing system to type the blood is fairly simple. It's actually based on the presence or the absence of only two antigens, or really three, but two main antigens. I'll get to that third one in a minute. So antigens are molecules that are in the membrane of a cell. That's what the antigens are. And antigens have the ability to provoke an immune response. And that's a little bit more for the lymphatic system. So the antigens in the surface of the red blood cell, in the membrane of the red blood cell, that make up the ABO blood typing system are nothing more than what were called the A antigen and the B antigen. And that's it. If you have the A antigen, you're type A. If you have the B antigen in the surface of the red blood cell, you're type B. If you have both the A and the B antigen in the surface of the red blood cell, you're type AB. And if you have neither, the A nor the B, you don't have either one of these in the surface of your red blood cell, then you're type O. Now, your genetics that you inherit from your parents are exactly what gives you your blood type and thus which antigens would be presented. And so it turns out this way. If you receive at least one A gene from one of your parents, you make the A antigen. So you would at least produce the A antigen. If you receive the B gene from one of your parents, you at least produce the B antigen. If you inherit one A gene and one B gene from the other parent, you would produce both the A and the B antigen in which case you would be type AB. But there's another gene, it's called the null gene, and it's basically a DNA space holder. It doesn't code for the production of the A nor the B antigen. So if you receive what's called the null gene or the I gene, or in some books they call it the O gene, if you receive the I gene from both parents, you won't make the A or the B antigen in which case you'll never display them in the membrane of the red blood cell and you're type O. So the majority of our population is type O. Now the percentages of these blood types change depending on what region of the world you're in. You don't have to go and look all of that up. That's not gonna be on the test, but 
In other words, there's more I genes floating around out in the population than the A or the B. So there's more type O people. AB people are, are least amount. Uh, then, so it goes, uh, the, mo the majority is O, then you go A, then B, then AB in our population, right? And that can go up or down depending on the region. But nonetheless, the blood typing system is pretty simple. If you make and present the A antigen, you're type A. If you have the B, you're B. If you have both A and B, then you're AB. If you have neither one, then you're O. That's how simple it is. The more difficult part, which is not even difficult, but students kind of confuse it, is learning without having to memorize a whole bunch on a big chart, is learning who can receive blood from whom. And here's how you do that. The second piece of information that we have to know about the ABO blood typing system, besides the antigens that are presented at the surface of the red blood cell, is, or are, I should say, the types of antibodies that are in the plasma of the person's blood. Antibodies are in the plasma, antigens are in the membrane of the red blood cell. So what type of antibodies are in the plasma of the patient? Well, let's see. If you're type A, that means at the surface of your red blood cell, you have the A antigen. And since you have the A antigen, you don't want any blood put in your body that has the B antigen on it. Because the B antigen is not yours. It's a foreign antigen. It's foreign. And our body does not want foreign antigens in it. So, for instance, I'm A positive. I'll get to positive in a minute. And since I'm A positive, I know that I have the A antigen in the surface of my red blood cell. It means though also that I don't want any blood put in my body that has the B on it because the B is not mine. It's foreign. So I can't get B blood and I can't get AB blood because AB has B on it. So to protect me from the B antigen, which would actually kind of kill me, would kill, could possibly kill me, I have in the plasma of my blood, anti-B antibodies. So all people who are type A have anti-B antibodies in the plasma of their blood. All people who are B have the B antigen in the red blood cell, but they have an anti-A antibody in the plasma of their blood. People who are AB, have the A and the B antigen in the red blood cell membrane, but they don't have either the anti-A nor the anti-B anti antibody in the plasma. Because if they had either one of these antibodies, they would attack their own blood. People who are O have neither the A nor the B antigen in the red blood cell but they have both the anti-A and the anti-B antibodies because the A and the B antigen is not theirs. So they have antibodies that will try and eradicate those antigens if they enter their body. That's the exact reaction you don't want to happen in your body because here's how antibodies work in a nutshell. Notice in the diagrams that I drew that I, I'm calling the antigen with the complete circle A. This is the A antigen, nice smooth circle. I'm calling this globular little piece the B antigen. Notice the anti-A antibody at this end of it up here has little spots that can very specifically bind to that circle. So these little areas at the ends of the antibodies are the areas that actually bind to the antigen that they're made against. 
So anti-A antibodies actually react and bind to the A antigen by binding right there. Anti-B antibodies, notice how it's kind of globular. And of course, this is just for the pictures I made, but they, they don't fit around this complete circle very well, but they fit on this globular unit pretty good. So anti-B antibodies actually bind to the anti-B antibodies. Now, here's what would happen if you stuck any blood in an A person that has the B antigen on it. You're gonna kill them. Or at, at best, you're just gonna make them really sick. If you put any blood into an A person that has the B antigen on it, their anti-B antibodies will bind to these B antigens and it will clump all of the cells together. And when they start clumping all, when these antibodies start clumping all the cells together, it clogs up blood vessels. It can cause blood clots all in the body. So that can cause strokes if you block up vessels in the brain. It can cause a heart attack if you clog up vessels in the heart, so forth and so on. And ultimately it can cause the cells to burst open, which leads to a toxic syndrome in the body, but that's a little too much for the talk at hand. But nonetheless, what you don't want to happen is you don't want the antibodies that a person has against the blood type antigens to ever react to their antigen. So the reason why I'm telling you this is this, you know how you can learn what type of blood a person can receive is by knowing what type of antibodies they have in the plasma of their blood. Because whatever antibody they have in the plasma of their blood is the type of blood you can never give them. I'll say it again. The type of antibody that they have in the plasma of their blood is the type of blood you could never give that person. For instance, a type A person has anti-B antibodies. That means you can never give an A person B blood. Because if you stuck this B red blood cell in their body, their anti-B antibody is gonna to react to that antigen and that's bad, bad, bad. Don't want that to happen. You also could never stick AB blood in a type A person because AB people have the B antigen on it. Can't do it. You don't want their antibody reacting to their antigen. That's what you never want to happen. So since type A people cannot get type B blood and they can't get AB blood, the only blood a type A person can get is their own. They can get type A and they can get type O, right? So A people can get A and O. B people have anti-A antibodies. So you can't put any A blood in their body. Can't put A, has the A on it. You can't put AB because that has the A on it. You don't want their antibody reacting to the antigen. So B people can only get B and they can get O. Now AB people, since AB people have both the A and the B antigen, that means they have neither the anti-A nor the anti-B antibody. Because if they had either one of these antibodies, they would attack their own blood. And you don't want that to happen. So for that reason, since they don't have the anti-A nor the anti-B antibody, there's no antibodies to react to any antigens. So AB people can receive all of the blood types. They can receive A, they can receive B, they can receive AB, they can receive O. 
because they don't have the antibodies. Now, O people have both anti-A and anti-B antibodies. The reason why in their plasma, the reason why they do is because they don't have the A or the B antigen. And since they don't have the A or the B antigen, the A and the B antigen is foreign. So their immune system makes anti-A and anti-B antibodies. So you know what that means? You can't give them any blood that has A on it because the anti-A antibody will react to it. You can't give them any blood on it that has the B antigen on it because their anti-B antibody will react with it. So you know what kind of blood an O person can get? Only O, all right? Now, that's the base blood types. Pretty simple, A, B, A, B, and O. There's actually eight ABO blood types because there's another antigen. The other antigen that you either can possess, that you either do possess in the surface of the red blood cell or you don't is called the RH antigen. The RH antigen, if it's present in the surface of the red blood cell, the blood type that that person is would be called a positive one. For instance, this diagram that I made has the A antigen in the blood cell right here. That would make this person type A. But since they also have the RH antigen, it technically makes this person A positive. A positive. Now, same thing over here. This person has the A antigen, so they're type A. But there's no RH antigens. So if you don't have the RH antigen, the blood type is said to be a negative one. So this person has A, but no RH. That blood type is A negative. Now, I have to complicate things a little bit but it still remains simple if you always remember what antibodies the person has along with two other statements that you have to write down. So if you're ready, get your pencil and pen out and write these statements down. Positive blood types can receive both the positives and the negatives of the blood types they can receive. I'll say it again. Positive blood types can receive both the positives and the negatives of the blood types they can already receive. So for instance, let's go back to this chart. Type A people have the anti-B antibody, which means since they have the anti-B antibody, I can't put any blood in their body that has the B antigen on it. So A people, the base blood type, can only ever receive type A and type O. A positive people can receive four different blood types. They can receive their own, which is A positive, but they also can receive A negative. They also can receive O positive and O negative. So how do I know that without memorizing all of these letters? Because I already know that A people, since they have anti-B antibodies, can never receive any blood with B on it, which means they can only receive A's and O's. On top of that, 
if the A person is a positive A, an A positive, positive blood types can receive the positives and the negatives of the blood types they can already get. And I already know that A people can only get A and O. So A positive people can get A positive and A negative, O positive and O negative. And just to remind you while you're studying, I made this table down here. But you don't want to go memorize this whole table, right? It's easier not to memorize it. Now, what about negative blood types? Well, you need to write this statement down. Negative blood types can only ever receive the negatives of the blood types they can already receive. Negative blood types can only get the negatives of the blood types they can receive. So look at A negative. This person is A negative. They have the A antigen, but there's no RH. That makes it negative. I already know from my base chart that A people can only get A and O. The positive and negative does not change that. The positive and negative only changes if they can receive positives or negatives or both. Not the base blood type of what they can get. So I already know that this person is A, so they can only get an A and an O. But what type of A, what type of O can they get? Since they're A negative, and I know that negative blood types can only receive negative blood types. I know that this A negative person can only ever receive two blood types, A negative and O negative, and that's it. Because A people can only get A and O. Negative blood types can only get the negatives of what they can get. So A negative can only get A negative and O negative. Same thing with B. B positive can get four blood types. Remember, B people have anti-A antibodies. So you can't put any blood in their body that has the A on it. So B people cannot get A and they can't get AB. So what, it, what can B people get? Well, B and O. So if you have a B positive person, they can get four blood types. They can get B positive and B negative. They can get O positive and O negative. Now, AB positive people, if there's a person that is AB and they have RH, they would be considered AB positive. And AB positive people are called the universal recipients because AB positive people can receive all eight blood types. So let's go to, back to the base chart. Look at AB people. AB people have both the A and the B antigens which means they don't have the anti-A nor the anti-B antibodies in the plasma. And since they don't have these antibodies, you could give them A and B, A, B, and O. They don't have any antibodies to cause a reaction anyway. So A, B people can receive all of them. A, B positive can receive the positives and the negatives. So that means this A, B positive person can get a positive and A negative, B positive and B negative, AB positive and AB negative, O positive and O negative, universal recipient. Now here's the bad thing about AB positive people. AB positive people can only ever give blood to an AB positive person. No other blood type can receive AB positive blood except for 
an AB positive person. And that's it. Now, even AB negative, AB negative people are not completely universal recipients. That's why we don't call them that. You know why? Because if this person was AB negative, remember, negative blood types can only get negatives. Yeah, they can get each one of the blood types, but an AB negative person can only get A negative, B negative, AB negative, and O negative because negative blood types can only get the negatives. So I hope everybody's kind of following me with that. The last one is, are people who are O. O positive people can receive two blood types. O positive and O negative, and that's it. Remember, O people can only receive O. And you know why? Because O people, do not have the A nor the B antigen in the red blood cell. That means they have both the anti-A and the anti-B antibodies, which means you can never put the A antibody, I mean A antigen into their blood or the B antigen into their blood because then you're gonna make these antibodies react to it, which is what we don't want to happen. So O people cannot get A, B or AB. They can only get O. So if people are O positive, that means they can get two blood types. They can get O positive and O negative. Now, the most sought after type blood type, everybody knows is O negative, right? You might not know why, or you might know why, I don't know. It's because all eight blood types can receive O negative without, you don't even have to type a person. If somebody comes into the emergency room and they lost a ton of blood and they're dying, you don't have time to type their blood. So you know what the, the doctor orders? Give me four units of O neg stat. You probably heard that on a medical show or something. They want O negative blood because they don't have time to see what blood type the person is before they die. And everybody can receive O negative. So O negative people though, can only receive O negative. O negative can give to everybody, in which case, O negative is called the universal donor. However, lo and behold, O negative can give to everybody, but they can only receive their own, which is O negative. All right, I have a couple of things left that I need to talk about, and then we can uh, field some questions. Um, and I need to show you a couple of pictures I want to look up because I, di I didn't have them in here but we need to learn how to type blood. How do we type a person's blood type, you know? I mean, how do we do that? Well, you have to perform what are called agglutination tests. Agglutination reactions are when red blood cells clump together in a little plate or a test tube, whatever you're testing it in. You have to take a sample of a person's blood and put it in test tubes, or you put them in these little special dishes, and then you treat the person's blood with antibodies. So for, and test for a positive or negative reaction. So here's what we're testing for. Let's say I took somebody's blood and I stuck it in a test tube. And I want to see if there are B antigens on the surface of the, of the blood, red blood cell. How do you determine if the B antigen is present at the surface of the red blood cell? Well, you have to treat them with an anti-B antibody. It's called anti-B serum. Now, Notice this picture I drew and I, I put in here. Have all these little blood, red blood cells here. Notice it has anti-A antibodies on it. So now what I do in the Petri dish or the little test tube that I put this blood in, I put anti-B antibodies in there. Now, if I see 
all of the blood cells start to clump together because you would be able to visually see that. They start to fall out of solution because they all clump together. When the blood cells are clumping together, that's called agglutination. And when they clump together, you can visually see it. Because look what happens. If you put blood in a test tube, I'll show you it this way. If you put blood in a test tube, the tube's going to turn red, obviously. If I take a test tube and I'm trying to test what antigens are on this person's blood, I have to treat that blood sample with the antibodies. So if I want to see if the B antigen is on that blood, the blood cells in here, I would put anti-B antibody solution in there, which is called anti-B serum. And if there were B antigens, all of the blood cells would start to clump together and I would start seeing clear spots all through the test tube because all the blood cells start to clump together. If the blood cells do not have the B antigen on them, as in this diagram, would represent what I call a negative agglutination reaction. The anti-B antibodies are not binding to any antigen. So the blood cells stay flowing free in solution in the tube. They don't clump together. However, I take the same sample of blood and I treat it with anti-A antibodies. I get this picture at the top. So if I took this person's same blood sample, but put it into a different test tube, not the same tube that I treated with the anti-B antibody, but in a different test tube, and I put anti-A antibodies in that test tube, if the A antigen is present, the anti-A antibodies are going to lock on to the antigens and link them all together. This causes all of the cells to clump together, which is called agglutination. This would be very recognizable, a visual cue in the test tube because all the cells start to clump together and fall out of solution. And you start to see gaps and clear spots in the tube. So now, since I treated this blood with anti-A antibodies and it clumped all the cells together, it tells me that this blood sample at least has the A antigen on it. In which case, I know that this blood type is at least A. Now, I didn't draw another picture, but you would also test for RH right here. There's another antibody. It's called the anti-RH antibody. If I want to test somebody's blood, you actually you test the person's blood three times. You test it with the anti-A antibody once. You test it with the anti-B antibody. And then you test it with the anti-RH antibody which is often just called anti-D, as in dog, the anti-D antibody. So to test a person's blood to get their full blood type, like A positive or A negative or B positive or B negative, you have to test for the presence or absence of the A antigen, the B antigen, and the RH antigen. And what you're looking for when you test their blood are positive agglutination reactions. If you get a positive reaction for the antibody you used, you know that antigen is present. So in this case, I know anti-A antigens are present. In which case, from my little table, I know that it's type A. Now, I would also test for RH with the anti-RH antigen, I mean antibody. And if I have a positive reaction, it tells me that the RH antigen would be present. And it gives me further information to know that that blood type would be A positive. If I treat the person with the anti-RH anti antibody and I get no reaction, 
because the Rh antigen would not be there, I know the blood type would be A negative. So I hope you're following that. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to recap on that in a second. The last thing that I wanted to do in this packet, though, is go over hemolytic disease of a newborn. I want you to read through this and know the scenario of how it comes about. It's not too terribly difficult, but some students do confuse it a little bit. So let me tell you what happens here. Hemolytic disease of a newborn is a blood disease of the baby that grow, growing in the uterus of a pregnant female. And it can come about this way. First of all, positive blood type females, their babies would never develop HDN ever. All right, I'll say that again. A female that has any one of the positive blood types, they could never develop hemolytic disease of a newborn ever. So the only females, and thus their baby growing in utero, for the baby to potentially develop hemolytic disease of a newborn, the female, the pregnant female, has to have one of the negative blood types. That's the precursor. The female has to have one of the negative blood types. Now, what happens? Well, This also explains, before I get into it, this also explains why you never, ever, ever want to give a negative blood type person positive blood type, ever. And here's the scenario why. If you have a negative blood type mom and she becomes pregnant with a positive blood type baby, the mom is fine, the baby's fine. Nothing's wrong with the baby, nothing's wrong with the mom. Because while the baby's growing in utero, the mom's blood does not enter the body and vice versa. I hope you all know that. However, so during the term of the baby growing to full term and then to delivery, the baby's fine. However, when the mom goes to deliver the baby and she does not get the drug called Rogam, which I may have in this paragraph somewhere. I don't see it off and um, I can't believe I wouldn't have written it in there. Um, the drug is, it might be in there. I can't read it that quickly. It's in there. I see it. Okay, good. The drug is called Rogam. And so fem uh, a negative blood type females get Rogam before birth and after they deliver a baby. And any female that comes in to deliver a baby, if they don't know her blood type, will get Rogam. Because Rogam doesn't have any side effects. It's basically an antibody. And so what that drug does, what the antibody does, that medicine does, is it blocks the mom's immune system from ever recognizing the RH antigen on the baby's blood. Because look what happens at delivery. Yeah, during the term of, of, of growing, in, uh, you know, gestation, the baby's growing, the blood does not mix. So the mom's immune system is not sensitized to the RH antigen. However, when the mom goes to deliver the baby, the placenta is gonna rip away from the uterine wall. There's a pretty good bit of bleeding there. So there's gonna be some mixing of mom's blood and baby's blood during delivery. So if the mom does not get Rogam, there is a potential chance, and notice I said potential, it's not 100%, but there is a potential chance that after, after that delivery of that baby, that her immune system from that point on for the rest of her life, she will produce anti-RH antibodies. And that's bad. Because if that female ever becomes pregnant with another RH positive baby, 
the baby potentially can get sick with hemolytic disease. And the reason for that is this. We haven't covered it yet, but there's five major classes of antibodies. The only class of antibody that can cross the placenta, which is a good thing, because the mom's blood is providing antibodies into the baby's body that is not able to make antibodies yet. There is a class of antibodies that can cross the placenta. The problem is, is anti-RH antibodies are that class of antibody. You don't want anti-RH antibodies going from the mom's body across the placenta into the baby's blood if the baby is RH positive. Because if the baby is RH positive, let's pretend like these are, ant are RH antigens and these are anti-RH antibodies right here. If this is the baby's blood, look what the anti-RH anti antibodies would do from the mom's body. Gets across the placenta into the baby's blood, it would start to cross-link all of the bl baby's blood cells together and start to clump them all together and clog up all the baby's arteries. The baby potentially can die in utero and can be stillborn. That's the worst case scenario. Under some... Ex uh, extensions of this and I've heard from females that their baby had it before but they were just sick like the baby was born they were in NICU for a while and they came out of it so it's not a death sentence but it could be it can be as severe as death or just being the baby could be sick but you never want a negative blood type person to ever produce anti-RH antibodies ever. That's why you never give a negative blood type person a positive blood type. Now, one of the few ways that a negative blood type female on the first pregnancy, her baby can develop HDN and not the second one, but the first one is if her body was already sensitized to the RH factor. In other words, if her body is already producing anti-RH antibodies, because at some point in her life, she has introduced a positive blood type in her body, like uh, drug abusers that share needles. If a person was positive, they shared a needle with a person that was negative. Or if a person went to the hospital and somebody gave that person the wrong blood type. They gave them a positive type when they're a negative type. If the mom was sensitized previously to becoming pregnant, that's the only way that the first baby she becomes pregnant with, RH positive baby, could ever develop HDN. She has to already be producing anti-RH antibodies. Now, in a normal case, let's say she wasn't making it. The first baby that was delivered would grow up and be fine. That baby's not sick. If the mom does not get Rogam, there's a potential chance that her immune system produces anti-RH antibodies, in which case every subsequent RH positive baby that she becomes pregnant with potentially can develop erythroblastosis fatalis. That's the other name for it or HDN. All right, now, so that's all I wanna say about that. You can read that. If you have questions on it, just email me. What I wanna do now, just hold on one second, is show you a blood typing picture. All right, so what I did is I typed in ABO blood typing. How can we type somebody's blood and what would it look like, all right? Well, let me show you a typical test, a picture of a typical test. How do I make that bigger? Oh, I didn't want all that. Um, I guess I can't make it bigger. All right, hopefully you guys can see this. 
pretty good. Um, in fact, let's use this picture right here. Oh, good, it's bigger. This is the one that we really want to use because here's what we have. All right. Now, these are samples, untreated samples of somebody's blood right here. Now, notice the coloration of it. Can y'all still see the screen, by the way? Yes. Yeah. Okay, good. All right. Now, notice the little spot right here is almost a smooth red. You see that? Smooth red, kind of smooth, smooth red, smooth red, so forth and so on. If I, if I take somebody's blood and I stick it in a test tube or on little wells or strips and I don't treat it with anything, it's just going to look red. So what that tells you is what a negative agglutination test is going to look like. Because let's face it. If you treat the blood with something and nothing happens, it's going to look like you didn't treat it with anything anyway. So look what I have to do for, for person number one. This is person's number one's blood right here. All right. All of these little wells come from this person, number one. All of these wells come from person number two. All of these for three, all the way down to eight. So this gives us all eight blood types, I bet. I didn't look at it, just pulled it up. You saw me pull it up, but let's read it. Now, there's three different wells here that I have to treat the blood with, anti-serum. When you're typing somebody's blood, you're testing for the presence or the absence of the antigen. You're using an antibody to test for the presence or the absence of the antigen. So let's look at person number one. Now, if I put person's number one in each one of these wells, and before I treat it with anything, each one of the wells is going to be a solid red, just like these. All of them would be red. But all of a sudden, in the first well, which I'm calling the A well, I put the anti-A serum. The anti-A serum is nothing more than an anti-A antibody. I put it in that well. In the B well, I only put the anti-B serum, which is the anti-B antibody. And in the RH well, which is also called D, I only put the anti-RH antibody, or anti-RH or anti-D serum. And then I'll wait a second and look to see if there's a reaction. So what type of reaction am I looking for? Hmm. Well, if I'm treating this blood sample with an anti-RH, anti -A, an an, I'm sorry, an anti-A antibody, and all of a sudden, I see all of the cells start to clump together. They all clump together. That's called agglutination. I know then that the anti-A antibody had something to bind to. And the only thing that the anti-A antibody binds to, lo and behold, is the A antigen. So, <coughs> excuse me. So if I get a positive agglutination reaction in the A well, I know the A antigen is present. So this person is at least type A. I know that. Look in the B well. I treated it with anti-B serum, which is an anti-B antibody, but I, saw, I see no reaction. This is a negative reaction. That means that the, the B antigen is not present. And if the B antigen is not present, there's no way that blood type can be anything with B in it. So this person is at least A. But look at RH. I had a positive reaction in RH well. That means the RH antigen is present. So you know what blood type number one is? A positive. You have A because you have a positive reaction in A. You have RH because you have a positive reaction in RH. And whenever you have RH present, remember the blood type is said to be a positive one. If RH is absent, like in this well, see no reaction? 
this blood type, whatever it is so far, we'll get to it in a minute, is a negative blood type. No reaction. All right, so let's do person number two. In the A well, I see a negative reaction. The cells aren't clumping together. So that means the A antigen is not present. I see a positive reaction in the B well though. All the cells clump together. Same thing in the RH well, they, all the cells clump together. So I know this person is B positive. Now, person number three. I see a positive reaction in A, which means they have the A antigen. I see a positive reaction in the B well. That means they have the B antigen. And I see a positive reaction in the RH well. That means they have, you, you guessed it, the RH antigen. So this person's blood type is A, B, positive. That's how you read that. A, B, positive. Because when you see clumping, the antigen is present. And everything is about which antigens you have. But look at number four. The A well has no clumping. The B well has no clumping. And the RH well has no clumping. You know what that means? Negative, re negative agglutination test for A. Negative agglutination test for B. And negative agglutination test for RH. That means this person is, you guessed it. O negative. O negative. Thank you very much. Now, that's how you read these things. I'm going to let y'all look this up. All you got to put in there is A, B, uh, blood typing, pick. That's what I wrote in. All right. Um, I don't know if I can save this. Let me see. Copy image. Don't we have one of those images in the learning resource? They do have one in the learning resource. You can, but like I said, you can look up anything you want. That's all I did. It was, it, it's the easiest thing to do. All right, I, I grabbed that picture. So if y'all need it, I grabbed it. I can email it to you or put it in a little file. But yeah, they have one of these in uh, the learning resources. Now this one has all eight blood types in it. That, that's why I kind of clicked on it, right? So you guys can, uh, but all you really have to know, do you have a positive reaction or do you have a negative reaction? If it's positive, the antigen's there. If it's negative, the antigen is not there. That's how simple that is. And you're, you're gonna have to be able to recognize blood types on the practical. That's why I wanted to go over that, all right? All right, let's see. How do I get back? It won't let me back in. Oh, yeah, it will. 